Say c'est bon. Welcome to Paris Good Food and Wine, here on World Radio Paris. I'm your host, Paige Donner. During the next half hour, we'll be taking you on a culinary adventure through Paris, while also shining our spotlight on the extraordinary talents and personalities that make up the landscape of Parisian culinary culture. So get ready, because a delicious escapade awaits you here on Paris Good food and wine. Say c'est bon. So I say it to you. Like those French people do. Because it's oh so good. Everyone. I'm Paige Donner, your host of Paris Good Food and Wine. In this program of Paris Good Food and Wine, We'll be looking at how French diplomats view the state of French gastronomy and why they appear to be somewhat concerned. Next, we'll hear from Remy Krug, who talks to me about the organization he chairs devoted to the study of French gastronomy and the art of fine dining called the Haute Etude de Goût. Then, we'll bring you a taped interview with our featured guest restaurant reviewer, Alec Lebrano, who had recently returned from his whirlwind U.S. book signing tour for his beloved Hungry for Paris and Hungry for France dining guides. He will also then share with us a review of one of his favorite Parisian left bank bistros. Last up is our market report by Emily Dilling, founder of the blog Perry Paysan, with her insider's tips of what's best right now at Paris's fresh markets. Stay tuned for this delicieux episode of Paris Good Food and Wine with me, Paige Donner, your host of the program, here on World Radio Paris. French diplomats launch a gastronomic fight back. This was the thrust of a recent article featured in expatica.com discussing the state of affairs of French cuisine vis-à-vis other countries, such as Japan, Brazil, Spain, Denmark, and Britain. Late in 2014, it was announced that Italy, the Italian culinary specialty superstore that sprawls thousands of square feet wherever it lands, will soon be coming to Paris. The rumors have it that the owners are in talks with Galerie Lafayette to house the new space in the Mahai, just near the BHV. To share a few numbers indicating this gastronomic success story, their four Italy locations in Tokyo last year welcomed 20 million customers. Their overall worldwide market share grew 200 million euros last year, from 400 to 600 million in annual revenue. Is there an equivalent of Italy for French cuisine? Not yet. Neither are there any rumors currently floating of creating something along those lines. Philippe Faure, co-chair of the Council for the Promotion of Tourism, was quoted in that December article as stating, we have to showcase the big establishments, and then we have to improve bistros and small restaurants. They are not often very good, and often they are expensive. In another sweeping gesture, French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius has announced, along with Chef Alain Ducasse, that in March of this year, on the day known as the Goût de France, or Taste of France, all around the world, French restaurants and French embassies will be serving the very best that France has to offer as a concerted initiative to share the country's gastronomic heritage with the rest of the world. That day is scheduled for March 19th, 2015. So, mark your calendars. You're listening to Paris Good Food and Wine. I'm your host, Paige Donner. Stay tuned for my interview with Remy Krug. Up next, he's the chairman of Haute du de Gou, an organization that is devoted to the world of French gastronomy and the art of fine dining. (laughs) 
So we're here in Reims, and I'm just going to introduce you, Mr. Krug, for a moment. So uh, you are the chairman of the Haute Etude du Gou, and from the day of its foundation in 2004, uh, the Institute des Haute Haute Etude du Gou, de la Gastronomie et des Arts de la Table, whose aim was to promote the art of gastronomy and fine dining on the national and international stage thanks to a top quality multidisciplinary educational program has been supported by University of Reims Champagne-Ardennes who decided to grant its students a university diploma entitled Diplôme Universitaire du Goût de la Gastronomie et des Arts de la Table. And today's symposium and conference celebrating your 10th year now uh, was sponsored in part by Le Cordon Bleu, which has been a dedicated partner of Haute to de Goût from the very beginning and also awards a certificate to the students. So as the founder, Mr. Krug, please, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, now that you're in your 10th year, what has the evolution been? When I'm back a little more than 10 years ago, and for me it is like yesterday, I was asked to join a conference, a presentation of a project about creating an institute on taste and gastronomy. And people were asking for my support as well as other, you know, winemakers and people from the wine and food community. And I went there and say, oh, again, another thing of that sort, you know. I go there to be polite, I will listen and then I will come back home quickly. And then when I was presented the program, the project... I was absolutely staggered. I thought it was, it's fabulous because it was the first time ever that we were presented by a program that would encompass every facet of the world, the universe of gastronomy, taste, and other la table. You know, each of the disciplines, whether, you know, cooking, sommelier, uh, welcome, hospitality, blah, 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 all that, each of these disciplines have uh, fantastic schools in France. They have fantastic training and and improving program, tra- uh, further training and uh, program stuff. But no one has so far had the idea to create something on top above that to uh, uh, present a program that we, is a cross-section that transcends every single discipline or job uh, but uh, covers the, the entire thing in what it means. What is the knowledge, the latest knowledge on what happens with you when you taste the wine or food, what happens, you know, everything you have to know about what is behind. It's not about learning about how to cook or how to make wine or whatever. No, not at all. But what is behind all that and what are the latest knowledge, the scientific knowledge and human and sociological knowledge and neurophysiology knowledge and that. And I said, I heard that, I said, well, you know, I lo- I've been loving food. I've been a food lover from you know, my childhood. And of course, being uh, the chairman of the House of Krug, food was my theater. You know, I was friend of all the top restaurateurs of the world and top sommeliers, etc. So I thought, wow, you know, this is fantastic. I would like to be one of her students. But I couldn't find that, you know, being a chairman of Krug to take two weeks away from my job to do that. But at some stage, they asked for a president, a chairman of this institute, and they came to me and said, would you chair that? And I said, of course, I'd love it, and I would do that. And the dream we had was to, knowing the multidisciplinary approach with covering so many facets and so many disciplines, was to uh, echo that with a multi-origin uh, uh, students from many countries and many activities or jobs in the food and wine and, and gastronomy and other like that community. And I think it's a fabulous reward, and I say thank you, and I love you all. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful what you've just imparted, uh, Mr. Krug. And what if somebody is interested in enrolling in this two-week course that you offer every every year, the university program? How can they prepare, and what can they expect from the course? First, I would suggest that they go on our internet site, uh, which is uh, H E G. Dash. Uh, dash. Is it dash? Or is it okay? Yeah. Gastronomy.com, I believe. Okay, you can check on that. Yeah. And then they have to see whether they understand this complex, original, unique uh, program and if they fit for it. And then uh, Colette Padé and myself and two other members, we judge uh, and we select. 
Well, that's wonderful. It's very inspirational. And I want to thank you very much for taking the time to, to talk to us today after this fantastic uh, conference that you just held right across from the Cathedral de Reims, which is a very impressive uh, location. This cathedral, as you know, is where the coronation of the French kings took place because this is where, for the first time, a tribe, the head of a tribe in, in this area, uh, became Christian and from being pagan, and he was crowned here, he was baptized here at, at this spot before the cathedral was built, and uh, the, the holy bulb was brought by a, by a bird in his beak, brought the holy bulb on, the, on top of the Archbishop saint Remy to Christian Clovis, King Clovis, uh. and that's, from that moment every king of France had to come here to Reims to be crowned. <laughs> Very inspirational. Thank you very much, Mr. Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Paige Donner. Stay with us here on Paris, Good Food and Wine. Next, I'll be talking with Alec Lebrano, Paris Dining Guide author and our guest restaurant reviewer. So for this segment of Paris Good Food and Wine, brought to you by World Radio Paris, we're sitting in our studios here at the American University in Paris with Alec Lebrano. Now, Alec Lebrano is a very well-respected food critic and a restaurant writer, and he makes his home here in Paris. He has two books that uh, just released recently, the second edition of Hungry for Paris. The first edition came out in 2008, and the second edition, Hungry for Paris, came out in 2014, last spring. And his brand new book, too, which is Hungry for France. And that beautiful picture-illustrated tome also came out in April 2014, and that's by Rizzoli Books. So, Alec, to start off with, tell us a little bit about your your books, and then we'll delve into asking you a little bit about you. Well, Hungry for France, I I wrote um, when I was still the um, European editor for Gourmet Magazine, which was something I'd done for 10 years. And uh, if you have a job, a visible job like that, uh, with a lot of um, wearing a banner of food expertise, people ask you constantly where to eat in Paris. So I thought, I'm going to once and for all put all this down on paper so that when people ask me, I can say, oh, here's the book. Um, I also feel that if you're lucky enough to live here like we do, um, my pleasure in writing about food is sharing it. So I wanted to, I put myself in the shoes of a traveler. I travel all the time, so I'm a consumer of this information as much as I am a producer of it. And I don't want uh, 2,500 addresses in Paris. I want 100 good ones that will be, or 109 in this case, uh, good ones that will respond to different types of food, different neighborhoods, different atmospheres, different um, experiences of Paris itself. So it was a lot of work to winnow it down to 109 restaurants, but I think um, I think I've covered the waterfront pretty well. And I think uh, your readers agree with you too. Um, I like like I mentioned, I saw it front and center at Shakespeare and Company just the other day. How terrific! So, yes. Now, so then to turn the the spotlight onto you personally. So I know that you have you you had a fashion background, and now you're one of the most well respected uh, restaurant uh, critics and food writers here in in Paris in in France. How did you make that transition? Well, I moved. Um, I had been working for a newspaper in London before I moved to Paris, uh, and that was a serious editing job for a major paper in London. Um, I had a visa quandary, I think is the play way of putting it. So I came over here to wait for my visa visa issues in England to be uh, resolved um, and took a job working for uh, Fairchild Publications, which is a large American fashion group. Um, I knew nothing about fashion. When Mr. Fairchild interviewed me, he said, I said, I don't know anything about fashion. And he said, that's not a problem. You learn or I'll fire you. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, w Magazine, their glossy magazine, is not just fashion. It's also profiles, travel stories, 
uh, the occasional bit of food writing. And it was when I started working for them and doing the food stories that I really found I was enjoying it a lot. And um, as a newcomer to Paris, the best way to learn the city I found was through its restaurants. I didn't know anyone here. I was gifted with a big expense account. So I thought to myself, instead of being you know, lonely, lonely pants, I would go for it and decided every single night I'd go out to a different restaurant. I learned to go to restaurants by myself. Um, it helped my French. It certainly taught me a lot about the city and a, a huge amount about French food. Bravo, because you've now shared uh, that insight. So you've saved uh, many of us the um, the rigors of going out and discovering uh, all these all these addresses. So thanks for the the service. My pleasure. <laughs> the favor. All right. So then, when you're you know you mentioned just a moment ago about what you really love to do is share food. So I'm curious, Alec, when you're at home and you're just sharing a meal with friends, you know, or or family members, uh, what do you what's what's one of your favorite meals to to prepare or, or even just to sit down to? Well, I, for me, I don't. I'm not as much of a recipe driven cook. What I love to do on a Saturday morning, in order to uh, remain enthusiastic about restaurants, I never go out on the weekend. So Saturday morning, I go to the market. And um, I think like many, most Parisians, I buy what looks best in the market of a given morning and then decide what to do with it when I get home. So there's no, once in a while I'll follow a recipe. Most of the time I let the, the market tell me what to cook. Um, so for example, on a recent uh, autumn Saturday morning in the market in the Avenue du President Wilson, they had beautiful sap mushrooms, uh, they had gorgeous filet of sole. So dinner that night was um, sautéed seps and then uh, filet of sole with a puree of Jerusalem artichokes. It was a fantastic meal. Oh, that sounds beautiful. J- Jerusalem artichokes, too. I've, I've noticed they've had a bit of a renaissance the last few years, and I've, I only discovered them here in, in France. So, yeah. What, what's the French word for those again? I forget. A topinambour. Perfect. Well, bravo. And they're, they're, it's interesting, actually, Paige. The French had a category of legume or vegetables called legume oublié, or the forgotten vegetables, inclu- which included Jerusalem artichokes. A lot of them were forgotten because people ate them too much during the war. So rutabagas, parsnips, Jerusalem artichokes, all the root vegetables were uh, one of the very rare things that was available in the markets in Paris during World War, during the German occupation. So a lot of Parisians of a certain age, if you every time if they, even if they went near a rutabaga or a, any of those root vegetables, they you know they recoil. Um, so they were forgotten for a reason. But for those of us who don't have those associations, they're just plain delicious. I agree. A, pu- a pureed especially. Mm. Pureed especially. Thank you very much, Alec, for sharing your, your time and your insight with us here today. My pleasure, Paige. You're listening to Paris Good Food and Wine with me, your host, Paige Donner, here on World Radio Paris. So I'm really excited to hear today about this restaurant, uh, Moulin Avant. Because I have always wanted to eat there, and I haven't yet. <laughs> so, and I know it's one of the most classic little restaurant bistros um, in the fifth arrondissement here in Paris. Um, but you, you tell me uh, what you know. What what kind of cuisine? What, how, what kind of restaurant is this? Well, I had friends. Um, a well-known food writer was visiting from San Francisco, and she and her husband said, "I said, where would you like to eat?" And she said, "We don't want anything innovative. We come to Paris to eat traditional French food. We don't get that in San Francisco." So in order to make um, Peggy Knickerbocker ha- happy, um, I thought we should really go to a very classic French bistro. I love them myself. So I hadn't been to the Moulin Avant for a long time. It's over in the Rue des Fosses Saint-Bernard, uh, which is a great restaurant row across the street from uh, Jussieu University in Paris on the left bank. And it's really the, I think I describe it as a place, it's exactly the type of French restaurant that people go moony over when they're sitting in airplanes that are headed for Paris. I mean, it's a sepia-toned, old-fashioned bistro with a, a sort of a, a warm, uh, complicit, slightly body service style, banquet seating, cracked tile floor, shiny copper casseroles on the walls. Uh, as soon as you step in the door, you feel you feel warm, welcome, happy, and hungry. 
Nice. I feel like you just transported me to an accordion playing uh, Paris scenario, <laughs> you know? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, no, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it a, um, a female chef? Is it a woman chef on the head of the kitchen? Or? No, it's a man in the kitchen. And one of the things that's interesting there is um, today the chefs, you know, the chefs are TV stars in France. Um, the Moulin Vent is uh, the very talented chef in the kitchen, prefers to remain anonymous. Uh, because, he, as he said when I complimented him the other night, he said, you know, this is my métier. I'm a cook. He said, I'm not a chef, I'm a cook. And it's an interesting distinction because he learned, he's been cooking the same dishes like frog's legs, uh, Provençal, which is in a light garlicky tomato sauce for a long time. Um, and he's perfected a repertoire of classic, uh, mostly meat-based uh, French bistro dishes, and he does them beautifully. But he does it. He does it really, sort of like um, behind the big curtain in the kitchen. And he does not want laurel wreaths or stars or uh, any any praise aside from the fact that the dining room is full every night. Sounds sounds very humble. And and in French, there is that that distinction uh, in terms of the vocabulary, right? Like chef de cuisine is chef, as we call, uh, uh, versus cuisinier. The cuisinier is like the the name that they they'll say if they're if they're a cook, right? Well, there's there's been an evolution in the way that the the uh, the, the cooking profession defines itself, as you as you put your finger on. Before in hotel schools, people were trained to be cooks, a cuisinier. And chef de cuisine is the head of a kitchen with many chefs, uh, many cuisiniers working under them. But the uh, the métier of, of cook used to have blue-collar connotations. It's now become a very glamour, glamorized métier, uh, perhaps facetiously so, because cooking is really hard work. People, I mean, you, see, you spend a day in a kitchen, and it's a lot of, you're on your feet all day long, it's hot, you're under a lot of pressure, and it's very repetitive work. No, very, very good point to make. Very great distinction to make. Yes, yes. Um, and of course, métier. You, you use the French word, but for our English uh, listeners, career means mm -hmm, exactly. profession, career. Yeah. Um, and so, what is one of the most memorable dishes from from this restaurant? Like, what 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 would you go back for? Well, uh, at dinner the other night, I had it's mushroom season in in France in the fall. Um, I, I am a fungi feel or a mushroom lover. Um, <laughs> and they had beautiful sep from the Corrèze, uh, that were nice and garlicky. They were beautifully cooked because they were still nice and firm. And the garlic didn't overwhelm the sort of feral taste of the mushrooms. So that was the starter. And then I had, uh, Blanquette de Veau, which is a veal stew in, in, uh, bouillon enriched cream sauce with mushrooms, carrots, um, and some herbs. And um, it's one of the great, great bistro dishes. Um, people, do, it's hard to make. It's it's a sauce that's easy to make make a mess of. This was smooth satin, um, full of flavor and absolutely gorgeous. So when I see Blanquette de Veau on a menu, I, I I often do order. It's one of my favorite dishes. And maybe a good talisman too, as to the quality of the kitchen. Very, that's a, absolutely very much so. Oh, great, great. Now the our our, our two cliffhanger questions. Uh, would you go back for for seconds? And, and what kind of a rating would you give it? I'd go back in a heartbeat. Um, I think one thing I would point out for anyone who might be following in my footsteps, um, the Moulin Vent is it's a little expensive. Um, it's about, I'd say, probably, depending on what wine you drink, about 60 euros a head. Um, it's worth every penny. If I was really hungry for a, a, a beautifully done traditional bistro meal, I'd go back in a heartbeat, and I'd give it a, um, a solid B plus, A minus. Wow, top, top, top of the list. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alec. You bet. You're listening to Paris Good Food and Wine. I'm your host, Paige Donner. Next, we'll be hearing from forthcoming published author Emily Dilling, who brings us the Paris Fresh Market Report. I'm Emily Dilling for Paris Good Food and Wine, and this is the Paris Market Report. Today we're exploring Marché Biologique de Batignolles, one of Paris's three all-organic markets. Located in the 17th arrondissement, this market brings together farmers and artisans every Saturday morning. 
The wide range of fresh produce, meat, cheese, and fish draws crowds of Parisians and tourists every week. Our tour of the market starts with Patricia at the Oval du Coutant stand. The produce you'll find here is all grown in the Ile-de-France region, about 60 kilometers from Paris. I asked Patricia to tell us a little bit about the seasonal squash she sells in November. En tout, il y a à peu près six variétés de courges. D'accord. Ça, c'est des légumes anciens, avec des goûts différents. Donc, le potimarron aura un goût de châtaigne. Le pâtisson aura un goût de Patricia a explained to me that she has six different types of squash, most of which are heirloom varieties. She described the different choices, which include butternut, spaghetti, and acorn squash. Each variety has its own unique flavor, with hints of chestnut, artichoke, and hazelnut. Patricia suggests several different ways to prepare the squash, for example, using them in a soup, puree, or gratin. Marché Batignol is also a great place for food on the go, with chickpea galettes and potato pancakes being favorite snacks among hungry shoppers. My favorite market pick-me-up is the fresh-pressed wheatgrass juice at Hermione's stand, which you can recognize by its overflowing boxes of herbs, sprouts, and baby greens, in addition to the long lines of Parisians waiting for their fix of the bright green juice. Je vais prendre un jus aussi. Hermione's freshly pressed juice is made with curcuma, ginger, fresh apple, and wheatgrass. It is a popular item at her stand, which is one of the few places in Paris you can find wheatgrass juice. Not only does Hermione make a great juice, but her farm, which is also located in the Ile-de-France region, makes her locally grown produce among the freshest at the market. The sights and sounds of Marché Batignol are what make shopping here such a unique experience. It doesn't take much to get Normandy-based orchard owner Michel Boucher to sing you one, or a dozen, of his original songs, all inspired by his love of apples. Sur leur lèvres, les mots qu'ils ont dans le cœur, les mots qui apportent tant de bonheur au mois de mai. Ce tendant un joli brin de muguet que chacun cherche au mois de mai, sur leurs lèvres, je lisais tout l'amour qui s'offrait. Visit Michel's stand for fresh apple and pear juice, cider, and vinegar, as well as a specialty from his region, crepes. Another one of my all-time favorite stands at Marché Batignol is La Ferme de Noam, where the charming Isabelle and Benjamin sell their farm-fresh eggs. Benjamin was kind enough to tell me more about their production and where their fabulous eggs come from. Donc notre ferme se trouve en Bourgogne, région de Bourgogne, département de la Nièvre. Euh, non loin de la... Benjamin and Isabelle's farm is located in Burgundy, and it takes them over two hours to drive to market every week, which is quite a time commitment considering they go to three markets a week. They raise 1,200 free-range chickens on their certified organic farm. Their stand always has a long line of shoppers who are happy that these independent producers take the time to bring their eggs to Paris. You can also find Benjamin and Isabelle at Marché Biologique Raspail and Marché Biologique des Lilas. That's all the time we have for today, but you can continue to explore Marché Biologique des Batignolles every Saturday from 8 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. on Boulevard Batignolles in the 17th arrondissement. For Paris Good Food and Wine, I'm Emily Dilling, and this has been the Paris Market Report. That's all for this episode of Paris Good Food and Wine. I'm Paige Donner. Stay tuned for our next segment here on World Radio Paris. So I say it to you Like those French people do Because it's all so good 